Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Lori Schellenberger um, with the ACLU of California. I'm the director of the Voting Rights Project there. And on behalf of the ACLU, our partners at the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, Rock the Vote, and all of our co-sponsors, are they projected somewhere? Do we have a, we have, they're on the back of your program. Um, we wanna welcome, welcome you to our third and final Secretary of State Candidate Forum this year. We're very, very excited to be here on the Berkeley campus and we wanna thank the Center for Latino Policy Research for hosting us here tonight. I wanna to give a huge shout out to the Color of Democracy Fund which has provided the support for all of these programs. Um, we're hosting these forums because we want Californians to know that the Secretary of State has more power over our elections than any other individual. Um, a single decision by a Secretary of State can, can affect whether one individual gets to vote, whether your vote gets counted. It can even affect the fate of our nation. In 2000, and some of, I see people here who are probably toddlers in 2000, but in 2000, the Florida Secretary of State made a decision that determined who would become the President of the United States. Uh, last week, the United States Supreme Court ruled on a decision by the Ohio Secretary of State to cut back early voting in that state. And regardless of how you feel about those issues, they demonstrate the tremendous power that the office holds over our democracy. And so as voters, it's important for us to get to know these candidates and what their vision is for California's democracy, which I think you're going to learn tonight. It's isn't working too well lately. So uh, with that, I really want to recognize the two candidates on stage who have shown such commitment to participating in not just these three forums, but I think three other forums, more than any other candidates combined, I think, have, have done forums. So we want to thank them for their willingness and commitment to, to the process and to going more in depth with us tonight. And with that, I just want a couple of logistical things. This is um, thanks to Berkeley Technology Services. This is being filmed and live streamed on the Berkeley YouTube channel. Tumblr is also promoting the event and streaming it through Tumblr. And uh, Univision will be rebroadcasting it on radio stations across the state this weekend. Secondly, our last two forums generated a huge statewide conversation on Twitter. It was very exciting. And we want to continue that conversation tonight. There were cheat sheets when you walked in, so please participate. And we're going to be accepting questions from Twitter and Tumblr at the end of the evening. So with that, I want to turn it over to Helen Hutchinson, who is the president of the League of Women Voters of California. Thank you, Lori. Um, and I have the honor of introducing John Myers as our moderator tonight. John is the senior editor of KQED's new California Politics and Government Desk. A veteran of almost two years of state political coverage, he served nine years as the State House Bureau for KQED Public Radio and the California Report, and most recently he was a political editor for the um, Sacramento ABC TV affiliate News 10, KXTV. John served as the moderator of the only 2014 gubernatorial debate and was recently named by the Washington Post as one of the nation's most influential statehouse reporters. So John, to you. Thank you. It was very nice of you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And see, that's the audience participation part. Now you have to stay silent the entire rest of the event. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, all of the sponsors of tonight's event. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you to the candidates, of course. Um, because the clock is ticking. Election day is coming up. Uh, you get to cast a vote. One of these two men will be the next Secretary of State of California. And, of course, then they want to be involved in elections uh, for the next four years, which is part of what we'll talk about tonight. Uh, let me give you a brief overview of the uh, rules of this forum, and then I'm going to introduce the candidates, and then we'll kind of jump right in it and uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we go from there. Uh, so the debate follows uh, a format designed by the ACLU of California, the League of Women Voters, and California Common Cause. The format was agreed upon by the candidates, and of course it's all about ensuring that everybody has a fair opportunity to answer the questions and explain his position. Now, as I said a moment ago, you need to be quiet, but you know that. Uh, we asked the audience to just hold your applause, any approval or booing or, you know, that would be at me usually, uh, until, the, uh, until the event is finished. Uh, also, uh, a request to not photograph or videotape. We've got those guys in the back doing that. Um, very interested in comments and questions by Twitter. And the hashtag tonight is MyVoteMySOS. So you got all of that down if you're there with your smartphone in the audience. You're multitasking. 
Uh, the candidates will have 60 seconds for opening and closing statements, uh, 60 seconds to respond to questions, uh, 30 seconds for rebuttal. I'm going to ask a few questions. We have uh, community members who are going to ask a few questions, and then a couple from uh, social media, so everybody gets a, a little in tonight. Uh, they drew a number or flipped a coin, one of the two back there uh, behind uh, uh, the stage for opening statements and closing statements. And uh, so let me introduce the candidates and then I'll say who goes first. So closest to me right here is Alex Padilla. This is also in alphabetical order. Uh, Alex Padilla is a Democratic candidate tonight. He is a state senator from Los Angeles. He's a member of the Senate Committee on Elections, uh, past president of the LA City Council and current president of the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Pete Peterson is a Republican candidate next to him. He is the executive director of the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement at Pepperdine University, uh, experience in training and advising public officials on increasing civic participation through inclusive processes and the latest technology. So as you know, these two gentlemen have spoken a number of times. This is kind of the big moment. This is the last time, or you could do another one. I asked uh, the governor that. He didn't want to do two in a debate earlier. Uh, this election season. So by that coin toss, um, the first opening statement tonight is from Democrat Alex Padilla. So you've got one minute, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, as Secretary of State, I'll focus on uh, several things, creating jobs, increasing voter engagement, uh, increasing transparency of campaign contributions, and defending voting rights. Uh, there's a clear choice in this election. I have a record of getting things done in government. I know what it takes to turn ideas into policy and into action. And I'm the only candidate with the experience uh, to be effective on the first day in office. Uh, but I have to tell you, this uh, campaign itself has been uh, quite a journey for me. My parents were immigrants to this country. My dad worked as a cook. My mom cleaned houses. And they taught me that with hard work and a good education, anything is possible. Uh, I grew up in Pacoima and attended public schools. I earned a scholarship to MIT and graduated with an engineering degree. And a few years later, I was elected to the City Council of Los Angeles and then to the State Senate. And now I'm here. My parents were right. Anything is possible. And that's a message I'll bring to all Californians who may be a little cynical about politics. If you get involved and register and vote, anything is possible. Thank you. And uh, the next opening statement, 60 seconds, and I should remind the candidates, our, our very good timekeepers down here will uh, flash you cards when you need to quit. Uh, Pete Peterson, next opening statement. Thank you, John. You know, some of you may be wondering, how is it that a political outsider like me has won almost every significant newspaper endorsement in this state? The reasons are actually fairly clear, and whether you're talking about the LA Times or the San Francisco Chronicle or the San Diego Union Tribune, I found out we just got the endorsement of the Santa Cruz Sentinel, the reasons are fairly clear. Number one, this is an office that needs significant, not reformation, but transformation. And in doing that, they want an outsider with experience. Number two, they want somebody who's got experience and background in civic participation, using technology in a nonpartisan way to lead this office. You know, if you Google the phrase civic engagement and my name, you get over 300,000 hits. If you Google my opponent's name and civic engagement, you get about 4,500. I'm the un most uniquely qualified candidate for this office who's ever run for a first term, and I look forward to transforming this office. Okay, Pete Peterson, thank you. And so let's... Uh get going on the questions. A reminder again, these are 60 second answers, 30 uh, second rebuttal from the other candidate and uh, you know I might be a pain in the neck and ask you to follow up or redirect you for a quick time for 30 seconds or so and our timekeepers will give you that. Uh, the first question is for Pete Peterson tonight. Uh, Mr. Peterson, as you know, um, California has by I think just about everybody's account uh, failed at implementing a key part of the federal law that was inspired by the 2000 election law, which was a new integrated statewide voter database. Mm -hmm. Too much money, too many problems, mm -hmm. uh, more than 12 years overdue. Can you make a promise tonight, if you can, when, if you're elected, will you get this statewide database up and running? Can you fix it or do you have to start over? Well, one of the things I've said, I've actually looked at the RFP. It's a 511-page RFP that was awarded to a company called CGI last year to build the database. This is the same company that gave us healthcare.gov. So I've said for quite some time that there are significant concerns I have about the awarding of this contract. Uh, at the same time, I think 
the target date is for mid-2016 for delivery. Uh, what I can promise that we're going to at least make that date, but in speaking to county registrars and other people that have been involved in the technology behind this, basically what I've been told is there's no reason that we can't move that date up. So I absolutely promise that we will make the current target date of mid-2016. But again, in speaking with technologists as well as county registrars on this issue, I think we can move that date up. Okay. Alex Padilla, could you... Uh could you uh, get it before 2016? 12 years overdue. Right, 12 years overdue, and the current timetable is mid-2016, as Mr. Peterson mentioned. High stakes, it's the middle of the next presidential election. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll bring uh, to uh, uh, making sure that product is delivered, not just on time, maybe ahead of time, the same tenacity I have had in my 15 years in public office, whether it's capital projects in the city of Los Angeles or policy deadlines in the state capitol. You meet with elite contractors every week or more often if necessary. You identify the red flags early. You know, you gotta keep things on track and on budget, if not ahead of time and under budget until it's delivered properly. Okay, speaking of money, uh, Alex Padilla, the next question is for you. Oh, see, look, we had a comment from the audience. No, we didn't. She's just, <laughs> she's using her right to, uh, to comment. Uh, next question is for you, uh, Alex Padilla. Uh, in my years of, of campaign reporting, it seems like every local election official criticizes how much state officials in Sacramento want them to do and how little state officials are willing to pay for it. Uh, now, you both, both of you, I think tonight will no doubt say, I will lobby the legislature and governor for more money to carry out elections in California. That's great, so I'm gonna stipulate that you're both gonna lobby the legislature. But can you give me a specific idea of where we can find the money? State, as you know, you've been in the legislature. State doesn't have a lot of money lying around. Elections officials need money to make elections run more efficiently. Where can you find it? So I think uh, well, two parts. One, yes, lobby the legislature and the governor. Uh, for additional resources needed. And again, I'm the only candidate that's not only says they'll do that, that has done that. But I think there's a lot of resources to be obtained through improved efficiencies in the office. When we can conduct either the election side of the responsibility or even the business uh, unit uh, of the Secretary of State's office more efficiently, through those savings, we'll be able to reinvest uh, into uh, you know, how we do things. On the election side, I'll give you an example. You know, the, the voter registration, uh, ability to register on online that we achieved in 2012, everybody was excited about it. But you can actually quantify the money saved county after county and by the state uh, because it's a more streamlined process of voter registration. And we can do the same when we use technology to put out voting information and elections information in a much more efficient uh, manner for voters. Okay, but if I can, before Mr. Peterson, I get to you. Uh I'm talking about getting money to the locals. They need money to print ballots. They need money for voting devices. They need money for everything. Where do you, can, can you get it? Just briefly, where no, can you get absolutely. it? Absolutely, in elections today, elections today are administered county by county. So when you achieve these, these efficiencies, whether it's on the voter registration side or even how we conduct elections, that's money that's saved and realized by each county and each uh, registrar of voters. Pete Peterson, where can you get the money? You know they need it. You've yeah, talked to local elections. I have. Well, and let me just say a couple things. First, Alex, you've been in the legislature for the last eight years. To say that you're going to newly lobby the legislature or the governor for this money, I mean, I don't think that really stands up to what the record has been. And when I speak to folks out in the counties, they say they want a Secretary of State who's going to stand up to them. Now, something else that I've, I've proposed that you have not proposed is that we need to find out how money's currently being spent in the Secretary of State's office. I have pledged that in the first three months of being the next Secretary of State, that we will have the Secretary of State's agency budget up online in a format that's easily understood by a 10-year-old and an 80-year-old. That technology is out there. I have implemented that technology in cities around the state, and there's no reason why we shouldn't have a better handle on how money is being spent. Let me finally say that we don't really know where the status of both half of monies as well as Prop 41 monies are, but I would be amenable to proposing a ballot measure uh, in the next couple years, a bond measure, that would bring money back into transforming our elections process, because we do need money back in that system. I'm just going to come back here. He, he said you haven't done enough in the legislature, and then also the bond money. Would you give me a quick comment on both of those? Right, no, absolutely. You know, one, one clarification, correction, not just a clarification. I actually called for an audit of the Secretary of State's office and the existing fund balances of the HABA fund. These are federal dollars that Congress appropriated for election systems after the Florida 2000 debacle. Some counties have spent it down. A lot of counties haven't. The state of California is literally sitting upon tens of millions of dollars for new elections equipment. 
That's just a start. We're going to need much more than that for the next generation of election systems uh, because even the uh, failed uh, experiment with electronic voting machines from 10 years ago, uh, you know, technology has come a long way since then and our understanding of the systems. Yes or no on a potential way. bond. Would you support it? Yes potential no? bond, absolutely, because okay. we're going to need potential bond and, frankly, partnership with the federal government to fund the next generation of systems for a state the size of California. All right, you've heard it. Potential bond on a ballot. Write that one down. I'm looking for the news. I'm the reporter here. <laughs> uh, let me move on. The next question is uh, for Pete Peterson. Um, uh, Mr. Peterson, you know, we talk a lot about elections in the Secretary of State, but we know that the office does other things. Yeah. Um, one thing in particular that's talked about a little bit that I just want to highlight here is business filings. LLCs, corporate filings, more. You take in the paperwork for those people. You've said you want to do not only an intake of that, but an exit interview right. when businesses leave the state. Yep. Uh, and you say you've got experience as a businessman. What do you think that'll tell you? What would you do with the information? Well, you know, one of the very interesting things about the Secretary of State's office in California is we really have no idea how many voters there are in California. And we have no idea how many businesses are in California. I speak to business owners all over the state, and one of the things they tell me is, yeah, I've got a couple LLCs, but I stopped paying the $800 a year business franchise tax a couple years ago. And on the California state books, it looks like it's an operating business. I think it would be a very easy thing to do, and I'm very excited about just adding a few survey questions to the business registration form and business dissolution form. Because I envision a time on January 15th of every year of my administration getting up in front of the Capitol and saying, folks, we had 412 businesses leave the state last year, and here were the top five reasons why they left, and here were the top five reasons why they started here. Because we really have no clear sense. Every time there's a business climate survey, it runs into a cement wall in Sacramento. It gets written off as being some, from some pro-business group or some right-wing think tank. And the Secretary of State is actually perfectly positioned to be that survey and data gathering agency on small business. Alex Padilla, what would you do with the information, or could you do more with that information? Yeah, you know, look, that, that sounds good, but I think there's a huge piece missing. It's important to make sure that California is not only an easier place to start a business and to understand why some businesses may choose to leave, but there's a whole section in between. We want to not just start a business, but grow businesses and keep businesses in California. These filings that we're talking about are updated on a very regular basis. Those fees should be paid annually. Those are much more regular opportunities to find out what businesses are experiencing and what they need so that we can continue, uh, continue the fact that they're here, help them grow here before we get to the point where they want to leave. Just on the business filings really quickly, Alex Padilla, um, part of that was a budget problem in the Secretary of State's office. Right. That was money cut by the legislature. I mean, I think you voted for those budgets. Do, would you fight it differently as Secretary of State? No, look, absolutely. And the, the, our economic reality and the state budget reality is going to be very different for the next 10 years than it's been for the last decade. I think the general public understands that. We were you know, holding on to our education system and our health care social service uh, uh, safety net uh, as best that we could. Uh, but this is another example where uh, through technology, making it possible to register your business online, uh, can uh, realize efficiencies and savings for the Secretary of State's office to then reinvest in better serving those, uh, those businesses here in California. And then just quickly, Pete Peterson, yeah. I just want to be fair, but I want to say too, as you know, that whole data about businesses leaving, that's become a very political point. Yeah. You're a Republican candidate. Your Republican Party says yeah. businesses are leaving. Do you believe businesses are leaving? Well, let's find gross? out. Let's find out, John. I mean, right now we don't know. Right? I mean, what we have are, are these kind of business climate surveys that come and go. Nobody takes them seriously up in Sacramento. And again, the Secretary of State, this really wouldn't take that much. Just a ask three or four extra survey questions on the business registration and dissolution form and on the statement of information form that businesses have to fill out every year. I hear when I get out around the state how difficult it is to start and run a small business here. Let's get the data to make some decisions. I don't want to pivot too far into this, but go ahead, Mr. I, I, I just, just got to say, I mean, uh, yes, can California be more business friendly? Absolutely. Okay. But the whole Rick Perry notion that California, the businesses it's are storming Perry. out of the state yeah. is absolutely overblown. The reason Rick Perry comes to California to Ooh. quote unquote steal our yeah. jobs is because this is where they're John, created. It is, and, it is not and, Rick Perry, right? It is the economic development officer for okay. Raleigh, Scottsdale, Reno, Portland. They are coming here and giving our business and, owners a pitch to move. And with that, let's try something different. Uh, let's <laughs> next uh, see. You know, I just wind them up, let them go. Uh, the next question is for uh, next question is for Alex Padilla, if I could. Um, the Secretary of State doesn't play a role in the in the uh, process of 
uh, campaign finance and the debate. I mean, you did in the legislature much more, the laws of California. But, uh, you know, the secretary, of course, gets data to the public. But I think it's relevant to, to ask you and Mr. Peterson, too, about your take on the role of money in politics. It gets talked a lot about. Uh, do you think campaign contribution limits work? Would you push for more of them or less of them? Uh, you know, I think at, at this stage, uh, campaign contributions are limited. FPPC decides, you know, what the appropriate level is from cycle to cycle. The role of the Secretary of State is to make sure that information is public. Yeah. You know, I think the Secretary of State should play a more aggressive role uh, to make sure that information is not just available to the public, but it's available in a way that's more reliable than our current CalAccess system. And on a much more frequent basis, depending on the year, you can go up to six months before finding out which candidate or which campaign is raising money uh, from who. There's no reason, technology exists, there's no reason we shouldn't have at most a five business day time frame for all campaign contributions to be reported. When we make the contributions much more transparent, let the public right. and, and the press decide you know, how to hold the campaigns and candidates accountable. And, and I realize I'm asking you outside of the job, but I do but, think this is a highly visible position in state government to talk about money and politics. Do you think contribution limits work? Uh, I, I do mean, you support I, I them? I, I think they do work okay. for the most part, but I also think that, you know, um, be, because they are what they are uh, and campaigns cost what they cost, uh, it's uh, the, the, the one potential downside is candidates spend time trying to raise money to meet their campaign budget so we can communicate to voters. Uh, I'd rather see systems like partial public financing. Uh, the city of Los Angeles has a very successful matching funds program that can relieve candidates of the time demands to raise the money to, to fund their campaigns and allow for more time talking to voters. Do you think limits work, Pete Peterson? Yes, although as someone who's being outraised eight to one, you know, I would rather have some campaign limits. I, I haven't hit any of them myself. So uh, on the Voters Edge database, actually, that just launched today, it actually is a very transparent portal, and it showed that actually the top five givers to Alex's campaign are all unions. And if you add the totals of those top five uh, donors, they actually are more than I've raised for the entire campaign, just his top five. So I think, uh, I think limits do work. It keeps people honest. But the, again, the challenge for the Secretary of State, which is one that has failed us as voters for the last eight years, is finding and using and developing a database that is easily navigable, understandable, and one in which you can compare over a series of campaigns a politician's history in raising money. Right now, that is only available on the Maplite website, which again, as we've talked about many times, I've talked about many times, is a great model for where the future of technology is going in government. But it is about transparency, but I do support campaign limits. Okay. The folks at Maplite uh, love uh, hearing this, I'm, I'm sure. I know them. They're, they're good folks I am here not being town. paid for that yeah, endorsement. I, I, I understood. <laughs> not a paid endorsement. Uh, Pete Peterson, the next question is for you. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this one, if I can, in my portion of this conversation. In 2007, the current Secretary of State, Deborah Bowen, pulled the plug on electronic voting machines mm -hmm. in California. She said they were too easy to hack. They were too unreliable in terms of accuracy. I think I've heard both of you on this campaign brag about technology. So let's be specific here, if I could, Mr. Peterson. Would you, if elected, would you lead an effort for new electronic machines? And if so, are there ones out there that you could endorse tonight? Yeah, well, I, I think there are actually some interesting things we should qualify about that. Number one, electronic machines are being used in some counties. Orange County is actually using touchscreen voting. Uh, they are using uh, on technology that is Windows 2000 based, but in almost every other state in America, they are using touchscreen technology without any problems. Now, I will lead an effort to uh, transition us from, at least in, Cal in LA County, Inca vote into touchscreen voting, because I don't think we acknowledge the trade-off enough that without some sort of technology in the voting booth, we cannot offer things like early voting, which is something I support, like regional voting centers, which is something I support. And so whether it's connected to the HAVA monies or whether it's proposing a new bond measure to help fund this, uh, this will be a significant responsibility, not just over the next two years, but probably over the next six years, six to eight years, transitioning from really what is 20th, if not 19th century, uh, voting technology, which is an oxymoron, into the 21st century. Okay, but before I get to Mr. Padilla, uh, you know that a lot of people in California vote by mail. Those are paper ballots. Yes, they are. So and you would have a two-system universe then. 
machines yes. and okay. Yeah, I, I've said that it's, uh, I'm, I am not, I am against mandatory vote by mail. I've looked at research from Cal State East Bay that shows that minority populations as well as those at the lower socioeconomic rungs of the ladder are disenfranchised in states where they have gone mandatory vote by mail. Okay. There are a lot of improvements we can make to the vote by mail system, but there are also a lot of improvements we can bring to technology in the voting booth. So Alex Padilla, would you, would you support uh, a new generation of, of electronic voting machines? And, and, and I, you were kind of nodding there, so I think you're going to tell me yes. <laughs> Do you think the current secretary is wrong about hacking security privacy issues? The, the, I do support a new generation of electronic machines with one fundamental principle. You know, at the end of the day, our elections and our election results uh, have to be, we have to be able to audit them. Uh, and so machines can be very, very helpful, but the bold and I think correct decision that Secretary Bowen made when she first was elected into office was to decertify those machines that you couldn't audit. And so you couldn't tell if they had been compromised or hacked or not. The machines that are in use today have to meet that threshold test. Yes, you can audit the results to make sure uh, the results are accurate. Uh, but you know, to, to, to Mr. Peterson's point, technology does already exist. And I, and I do envision us going in the direction of you know, Colorado today, Arizona is on its way, others, other states that allow for technology to link multiple polling places and create regional uh, uh, voting centers because maybe it's more convenient for me to vote by where I drop my kids off at school or by the shopping mall or the grocery store and not just the polling place by where I live. Technology exists and that's an appropriate way uh, to use it to expand vote, uh, opportunities to vote, not to limit them, but to expand them in addition to vote by mail. Just really quickly, Mr. Yeah. Peterson, because yeah. I think it's, that I'm not really yeah. sure we've talked very much in this campaign about machines and that yeah. was a very high profile thing. Do you think the current secretary made a mistake by decertifying those machines? Or not? I don't think eight years ago she made a mistake, but the fact that we're still in the place we are eight years later is a complete joke. Okay. Uh, there is no good reason why every other state in America has gone past us in voting technology. Uh, there are some very exciting things that are happening there. You know, it has never been shown that a uh, DRE machine has been susceptible to fraud. I understand some of her concerns eight years ago, but I have to say, John, in speaking to county registrars who were around back then, none of them felt included in that decision. It was very much of an insular decision made by the Secretary of State without the involvement of our county registrars. There needs to be greater transparency and collaboration with our registrars in developing this next stage of technology. Okay. I, I, I agree, but just on that point yeah. of inclusion, because yeah. I think that's critical. Quickly, if you uh, could, yes. You know, that's one of the reasons I made a pledge when I announced my candidacy uh, to visit all 58 counties and 58 county elections officials in their uh, home counties. Because, the, you know, to improve the elections as we know it, it's got to be a partnership between the Secretary of State uh, and each of the counties. And to date, I'm proud to say I've been to 52 of those 58. The last six are on the schedule. We're going to get there before election. Okay, good. Perfect transition really quickly then to one of the final things I'll ask. Uh, Alex Padilla goes to you. We do hold 58 separate elections in California in some ways on election day. We don't really have a statewide election. They are conducted in, in, in local uh, communities. Uh, there is some variation from counties to counties uh, in the process. Would you support some kind of more statewide system? Would you want to change it in some way? Or do you think it works well the way it is to let everything happen pretty much on the local level? You know, it may not be the prettiest picture having elections in 58 of uh, each of the counties. Uh, I'd be wary of going towards centralization of elections you know, to the state. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a big leadership role for the Secretary of State's office to play in maybe creating some standards for all counties to follow. You know, case in point, in the June primary, we saw one of the closest, if not the closest, election result in the controller's race, not just for this year, but in California history. 481 votes determined, you know, the difference between the number two and the number three uh, vote getter in that election. And the question after question, depending on where you went, uh, of what the recount policy was in California, how we're going to move forward in determining who the true winners were, who were going to advance in November, was the best example of how the Secretary of State to play a leadership role in providing that guidance, providing that direction, and making sure people are on the same page when it comes to election law. Pete Peterson, you want you want more statewide uh, control over elections? Or yeah, no? this may sound a little weird coming from a Republican, but there we do need to centralize a bunch of stuff related to elections. Like what? And, well, there was a great report issued recently by the California Voter Foundation looking at how we conduct absentee ballots around the state. Uh, and uh, there is an immense amount of variation in county by county in how 
everything from the design of ballots, which varies dramatically county by county, and much of it is related to the fact that different counties have different financial wherewithal to be able to conduct elections. So the issue around you have a, you have a fairly wealthy county like Orange County, they're able to barcode the, the uh, absentee ballots that they send out. Other counties don't have that financial wherewithal to do that. There's no real standardization in the communication with the postal service around the state. So, and then as it relates to voting technology, we have some counties, again, like Orange County, that is using touchscreen voting, but we have many other counties that aren't able to do that. So uh, I really do think there needs to be not just leadership, but there needs to be a real collaboration with our county registrars and a real fighting for the funding that our registrars need to conduct elections with integrity. I think our uh, community panel probably is coming up here, uh, maybe they're in the wings, and they'll, they'll come up to ask their questions. If they're doing that, I'm going, to, I'm going to use my prerogative as the moderator for a thumbs up, thumbs down, basically a lightning question, because uh, Mr. Padilla just brought it up about the recount in June. Ooh. The automatic recount. Yeah. Would you support an automatic recount in the yes. state? Would you support an automatic recount in the state? Absolutely, I did, and I would say at a quarter percent, if that's yeah. the variation between first and second or second and third in a top two, that that would automatically trigger a state-funded recount. And the state ought to pay for it. And the state ought to pay for yes. it. Yes. Not the candidates. Correct. Okay. And Good. for some reason, we couldn't get that passed in the legislature. Okay. Well, there's another year, and another <laughs> secretary will come up in uh, January. So let's, uh, let's, at this point, let's turn over the questions to uh, members of the, of the Bay Area and university community, uh, questions to both candidates uh, with the same general rules for responding and following up. Uh, and it looks like, uh, uh, let me introduce the, uh, the, the community panelists really quickly. Uh, Jadon Terry Kuhn is the deputy director of uh, Mobilize the Immigrant Vote. Uh, Morgan Prentice is the co-president of California Common Cause of Berkeley. And Michelle Romero is uh, the Claiming Our Democracy director of the Greenlining Institute. So each of our uh, community panelists have uh, a couple of questions. We'll kind of go one round, one round. And I believe uh, the order, uh, the first question here would probably be for Mr. Peterson. Does that seem correct with you, uh, Jadon? Um, whatever is okay, determined good. by the so, point sure. toss. J Jadon, Jadon Terry Kuhn, your, your first question is for Mr. Peterson. Great. I was really um, encouraged to see that um, you were considering communities of color and those that are lower in their socioeconomic status. So I'm really glad about that. And this question kind of follows up on that. So according to a 2013 study put out by the UC Davis Center for Regional Change, Latinos and Asians, which are easily more than half of our state's population, are far below the state average in their voter registration rates. So mm. our um, uh, the general registration rate in California is 77%, but only 67% of eligible Latinos are registered to vote, and only 49% of eligible Asians are registered to vote. So, you know, efforts like offering online registration in multiple languages are a good first step, but obviously not enough. So what would you do if you were elected to close the registration gap between whites in our state and our communities of color? Well, and I think not only looking at that demographic breakdown, but you also need to then break it down by age as well, because there are those recent research released by Tufts University looking at ethnic populations, uh, especially millennials, and the fact that they actually have different needs. So there's a technology barrier uh, in particular around uh, how we enforce and enlist voters uh, at the DMV. You know, there has been a recent uh, evaluation done and there is a wide amount of variance between how DMVs practice registration of voters. There needs to be closer collaboration with uh, churches, community organizations, especially those that are connected to uh, particular ethnic communities in the uh, registration of minority voters, while at the same time, and I've heard this from so many different community leaders, the quality of the translations of our materials is something that needs a dramatic overhaul, uh, not just in absentee ballots, but in registration forms, as well as in, uh, is in the uh, voter information guides themselves. So we need to do a, a top to bottom review of that as well. Alex Padilla? Yes. Look, I very much appreciate the question, not just because that's a community that I come from, 
uh, but in light of what we've seen in so many other states across the country. You know what I'm talking about, the Texas, the Floridas, most recently North Carolina, not just Wisconsin. Uh, concerted efforts to try to suppress people's opportunity to register to vote or to actually cast a ballot. California should pride itself in being the counter example for all that. So what can we do? Uh, not just being you know, more creative, utilizing technology and better language translations, et cetera, but just frankly being smart. And you know, Mr. Peterson talked about improving voter registration through the DMV. That's just getting started. You know, I, I had a bill that will focus on further implementation that expands the motor voter law to allow for streamlined voter registration opportunities, not just at DMV, but at community colleges, at the CSU, at EDD, at Veterans Affairs, and at Covered California. Imagine the millions of people coming in to sign up for health care that are otherwise eligible to register to vote. Let's register them to vote in the process and have an electorate that much more represents the state of California. Okay, thank you. And the next question uh, is for Alex Padilla. Feel good, good, that's short. Next question is for Alex Padilla from uh, Morgan Prentice of uh, California Common Cause of Berkeley. Thank you. Um, my first question is, in the last election, less than one in three California's voters turned out to vote, and it is even lower among the youth. What specific ideas do you have to increase voter registration and turnout among students and young people? Right, it's got to be an all of the above strategy, whether it's better utilizing technology and social media to help get the word out, maybe make it more exciting. My district is in Los Angeles, not too far from Hollywood, and a lot of celebrities that you know, preach about uh, being concerned about civic engagement, it's about time we deploy them to excite uh, young people. But I'll tell you one example that came from my visit to Placer County. Uh, not, the, not the county with the highest overall turnout rate, but the county with the highest turnout rate amongst young people. And the idea is simple, and it's this. The, the Registrar of Voters visits every high school every year to talk about the importance of registering to vote, brings the voting booth with them, and they line up the students, whether in a classroom or an assembly, and they go through the physical steps of casting a ballot. Look, I grew up in a household where we didn't talk politics at the dinner table, and anything legal or official kind of makes you nervous. Uh, but the first time you think about going out to vote, if you've already gone through the physical steps, it's a lot less intimidating a lot less overwhelming. And so I'll pledge to do maybe not every high school in California, but as many high schools as they can if elected Secretary of State. Mr. Peterson? Yeah, I just wrote a piece on this actually in the California Forward. There are three big things that we can be doing. I mean, the use of technology to engage the, uh, our, our youth is, is something that we haven't used a lot of. California actually ranks in the bottom five states in America in the use of technology to engage our youth. That's something we definitely need to improve on. Uh, civics education is something as well. Recent research has shown that those who high schoolers that have gone through good civics education programs are more apt not only to register but actually to vote. And at the same time, there needs to be uh, I think more creativity involved. Alex talked about en enlisting Hollywood. We many other states use public service announcements and other uses of advertising and, and social media to engage our youth and, and younger voters. We don't do hardly any of that here in California. And so as someone who teaches uh, our next generation of voters at Pepperdine, and as someone who teaches high school teachers how to do better civics education, I think there are some great ways that we could be uh, really promoting and improving our civics education and our technological outreach to our youth. Next question is from Michelle Romero, the Green Lining Institute. It's for Pete Peterson. Good evening. 2.6 million eligible voters in California can't speak English very well, an issue that contributes to the low voter participation by Asian and Latinos uh, that Jadon was talking about a second ago. Language access, though, has consistently been an afterthought in state projects and programs related to voting. At the urging of community stakeholders, the current Secretary of State has been meeting the past year with an informal language access advisory committee. The committee is made up of groups with knowledge and expertise serving limited English communities and can advise on best practices. I'd like to know, if elected, would you take steps to formally adopt the Language Access Advisory Committee? How might you work with such committee? And how else would you structure your administration to reduce language barriers? So let me just answer, ask, answer your first question. Yes, I would absolutely continue that relationship. But I have to say, if the Secretary of State has been doing something with this group for the last year, a lot of community leaders that I speak to around the state have not seen an inch of change in that area. Uh, everybody I speak to, particularly in Asian American communities, uh, the translations of 
ballot information, ballot materials, voter information guides has really been dreadful. And so uh, I think this really needs to be a significant focus, not only in our printed materials and what goes online, but also to make sure our poll workers are better informed and trained, that when it comes, when someone comes to the polling place and English is not a native language of theirs, that they know exactly how far they can go in assisting someone for whom English is not a native language. Uh, that is something that I've seen, again, as I've gotten around the state, that we really are falling down on. Uh, translation services, but also this inconsistency in the training of our poll workers, not really understanding how far they can go to assist those for whom English is not a native language. Alex Padilla. So, so yes, first, uh, continued, if not increased, uh, input from this committee would be uh, uh, something I would uh, embrace as the next Secretary of State. Uh, second, you know, a, a lot, again, to be gained through the use of technology. Right now, this, you know, translation or elections information in non-English languages is really kind of done by a, a, at a jurisdiction by jurisdiction level, depending on local demographics. But there's nothing keeping us from, if you translate materials into Armenian for Glendale, California, or Los Angeles County, to make that available online for the entire state of California for other counties to benefit from even though their Armenian population for example hasn't reached the thresholds triggered by the, the the Voting Rights Act and I'll end with an example again part of my statewide tour a visit to El Dorado County where they only had a handful of months less than six months notice that the, Tagalog, the, the Filipino population had reached the threshold in that county that for this year they needed to provide assistance and materials in Tagalog you know, there's no, no prohibition for them to cooperate with Alameda, LA, others, for example, but why only give them three to five months notice? We have demographic information. We have census information. We can sense these demographic shifts years in advance, not months in advance, much more time to be much better prepared. Very good. Okay, uh, uh, next question is from uh, Jadon Terry Kuhn of uh, Mobilize Immigrant Vote for Alex Padilla. Thanks. Uh, so some immigrant advocates are pushing for the state to create an office of new American integration. So this office would be charged with creating a statewide strategy um, to help new immigrants um, fully integrate, including um, improving their social and economic mobility and also helping people to obtain citizenship, which obviously is a key prerequisite to voting. Would you support the creation of this office? If yes, how would you, if you were elected, work with this office to ensure the inclusion of new Americans in our democracy? And if you don't support it, what would you do independently to ensure the inclusion of new Americans in our democracy? So I lo love that question. I'm proud of the fact that my home city of Los Angeles under Mayor Garcetti has an office of uh, new Americans. And so I can point to two uh, starting points for collaboration with such an office in the state of California. Uh, number one, citizenship. You know, we talk about how many people are registered to vote and aren't voting. We talk about how many people are eligible to register but haven't registered. And you have another seven million, more or less, people eligible to become citizens and to begin participating in our democracy that haven't taken that step for a number of reasons. I'm not talking about the undocumented, that's a whole separate conversation. Uh, this is legal uh, residents in California eligible to become citizens that haven't. We should be more proactive in getting them to become citizens and participating in our democracy. Um, and uh, second, you know, once we do so, every immigrant upon becoming a naturalized citizen attends a ceremony somewhere and takes that oath of office. The state of California should be a partner in having a voter registration opportunity at that door to welcome them as new Americans and register them to vote. Pete Peterson? Well, this may be the one time where the title Secretary of State actually connects to the federal title. Uh, I haven't heard of this particular office before, but it sounds like a great idea, and I'll say that for a couple different reasons. Not just for the voter engagement and the opportunity to connect new citizens to the political process, but one of the things I've found over and over again here in California that many of our immigrant communities are also the most entrepreneurial. And again, the Secretary of State is that first point of contact for a new business starting up here. So I actually see a, a two-prong approach that we could be leading where an active and engaged Secretary of State, either through this agency or something similar, would be engaging our new citizens not only to involve them in our political process, but also in our economy, which again is really what makes this state so great. California was the first state in America, our, our 
1849 Constitution was the only state constitution that was translated in two languages, English and Spanish. We have a history of welcoming immigrants. And not only in our political life, but also in our economic life. I, I'm really excited about what could be. Next question uh, from Morgan Prentice is for Pete Peterson. Great. Um, California passed a same-day registration law set to go into effect in 2016. That will allow people to register and vote on Election Day. However, most people don't realize that you won't actually be able to show up at your polling site and register on Election Day. Instead, that law requires only that county election offices offer voter registration on the day of the election. This means a Berkeley student who shows up to the register to vote at their um, local polling station will be instead told to go to the o Oakland um, County Election Office in Alameda County before 8 p.m. if they want to vote. What will you do to implement same-day registration so that it is a real opportunity to register and vote on Election Day and does not actually um, dis disenfranchise more voters than it helps? Well, there are several states in America that are, have implemented effectively what is actually same-day registration. You're absolutely right, in part because of the unequal funding that we are offering to our counties, that there are fiscal gaps here that I think need to be overcome. At the same time, there needs to be gr better coordination and collaboration with our county registrars. But I, I absolutely think because it's doable in other states, it is definitely doable here. And so overcoming some of those issues, in part it's a communications campaign, in part it's a fiscal issue that we, better, we need to better fund our counties in the implementation of this, in part, and the reason that same-day registration is not due to be implemented until 2016 is that it can only happen after VoCal is implemented. And we're still a little bit hazy on when that's going to get done. And so integrating VoCal as well as same-day registration, making sure that's done in a seamless way, uh, the law was passed in 2012 to move to same-day registration. The name of it is same-day registration. There should be an understanding and a fulfillment of that law so voters can come, register, and vote the same day. Alex Padilla? Right. We're well, actually in agreement uh, on a large part of this. The, the same-day registration law that has been passed, has been signed into law by the governor, is contingent upon the state of California having this centralized voter registration database. You know, in, in conversation, we refer to it as vote cal. So this is the same system we talked about that's due to come online in the middle of 2016, uh, the next presidential election cycle, where we're going to see, I hope, uh, a lot of excitement, both in the primary and in the general, of young people wanting to come out and participate uh, in that election. So job number one is to make sure that project stays on track stays on time, if not gets delivered uh, sooner rather than later. But a big piece, whether it's same day registration or even the deadline, for example, of your vote by mail ballot to be returned to the county in time for it to be counted requires a much better public information campaign, communications to voters in general, but particularly young people and particularly young people who may be away at college and registered in a jurisdiction other than where they're living uh, on campus. Uh, so we have to do better be communicating as well. Okay, and uh, Michelle Romero, uh, your question, uh, last question here for uh, Alex Padilla. Okay. Formerly incarcerated people have the right to vote in California, but ongoing studies by the Green Lining Institute, the ACLU, and others have found that thousands of them don't know that they can vote. In many cases, they've been given wrong information about their eligibility, and this deters them from exercising their rights. If elected Secretary of State, would you champion legislation that would require every person that goes through the criminal justice system to be advised of their voting rights and given the opportunity to register to vote? Think NVRA style. If not, uh, what would you do to address this issue? Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I know we've talked about this uh, uh, matter at previous forums and debates and whatnot, uh, and I know even in my own district, in the San Fernando Valley, we have to constantly remind, whether it's campaign volunteers or, or constituents in general, uh, you know, if, if uh, you're still on parole, you, know, you, can't, you can't vote yet, but if you've served your time, or even if you're on probation, uh, you're, you still have a right to vote. The right had been maybe suspended while you were serving time, but if, you're, if you've uh, fulfilled your time for a felony or if you're only serving time for a misdemeanor or you're on probation, 
you can vote. And if you haven't registered before, there are ways through, through uh, counties uh, to uh, make sure, like you said, integrate them into the NVRA strategies. I talked earlier about DMV, community colleges, EDD, et cetera. The processing of uh, people at the local level can and should be a way to maintain as accurate and complete voter registration files as possible. Pete Peterson. I've said before, this is a very personal issue for me. I have a very close family member who did about five and a half years in medium and maximum security prisons. And I fully believe that if we're going to have a California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, then damn it, rehabilitation better be part of it. And part of rehabilitation is getting people back involved in their civic lives. And so this, again, is a very personal issue for me. I have met not only with uh, folks at All of Us or None of Us, which is a group that wor really works in this area, but I am passionate about making sure that those that have served their time and paid their debt to society, that we do a better job of communicating through our parole officers, which in many cases is a, is a missing link in this communication. When, I, when I've spoken to groups involved in this area, it has been parole officers not adequately communicating to the folks that they're working with, through parolees, what their rights are. And so working diligently to make sure that those that have served their time can then serve their time as citizens. And I guarantee you, I will be the Secretary of State fighting most hard to make sure that those that have served their time will become involved and engaged citizens again in California. Okay. Thank you, Pete Peterson. And thank you to the, uh, the community panel. All great questions there. Thank you very much. And so now let's, um, let's move to a couple of questions from social media, from Twitter. Uh, we got a couple of great questions from the uh, – uh, and thank you, by the way. I want to give them a little applause here. They're all leaving. I didn't know they were leaving. You could stay, please. It's a lot of fun. Um, we got a couple of great Twitter questions from the Disability Organizing Network. Yeah. And, um, and so let me, let me give those to you. Uh, the next question would go to Alex Padilla. Um, this question says there are nearly 5 million eligible voters with disabilities in California. What would you do to protect their voting rights? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, voting rights in this country, you know, are solemn. And I take voting rights and will fight to defend voting rights for any and every uh, Californian. And that includes the disability community. So depending on the nature of disability, we ought to have a multi-pronged strategy on how to make sure uh, every Californian who's eligible is able to cast a ballot. Uh, for some people, that means voting by mail, the convenience at home with uh, a family member or a loved one to assist in the voting process uh, is, is their preferred way. So we need to make sure vote by mail uh, continues uh, to exist in a serious way. But for others uh, who choose to come to a polling place on Election Day, uh, or maybe even before Election Day as we expand early voting, we want to make sure there's no barriers uh, to voting, either through you know, vision assistance, uh, the hearing impaired, language assistance, and something as fundamental as access into a polling place, particularly in our rural communities, our older communities, where the accessibility of the polling place doesn't meet the standard that it should, whether it's curbside voting or retrofits. Uh, you know, we have to make sure we're doing everything to remove the barriers to voting for all Californians. Pete Peterson? Yeah, and in part of this, again, it goes back to some of the funding issues and around technology in the voting booth. Uh, there is a disability act, um, advisory committee to the Secretary of State's office. I've just looked at the website today, and apparently they meet three or four times a year. Uh, I think there needs to be a much more active engagement with uh, our communities involved and working with those with disabilities. But at the same time, uh, we talk a lot about technology, but many of the solutions, especially in this area, are ones that will only be fulfilled through technology. And California, again, is in one of the bottom five states in America in using technology in the voting booth. And so making sure that we are fully funded in this area not only helps all voters get better access to the polling place, enables things like early voting and regional vote centers, but it also helps those with disabilities uh, in supporting their rights and ability to participate in our de democratic process. And, and the second question I think is, is somewhat related, so let me uh, uh, put it first to you, Pete Peterson, uh, talks about uh, vote by mail. Yeah. which is out there, but of course, uh, people with dexterity issues, people who are blind or have uh, seeing disabilities, don't have a private and an independent ballot there as an option. Yeah. Well, again, this, this is in part goes back to the recent report by the California Voter Foundation, which looked at the real inconsistencies county by county in how they're able to administer vote by mail. And part of that relates to the ballots that we send to those or those that 
uh, in our, that are disabled in their ability to participate through vote by mail. Uh, we need to bring much greater funding as well as support to that to our counties that are trying to engage those with disabilities through vote by mail. There's a lot of work that we can do both in design concepts to improve and bring consistency across counties in everything from the, the information that we give them, our voter information guides, as well as to the actual ballots themselves. Uh, Alex Padilla has a couple of quick thoughts on that. Uh, again, these concerns that people need a private independent vote, and we, this kind of goes to part of what you were talking about before, you, you have to ensure that, and how do you ensure that? Right, again, and, and I think the way you ensure it is by providing uh, a number of options and opportunities for people who want to vote to vote. So for many people, it will be more comfortable with a trusted friend or loved one at home to cast a ballot. For those who, who choose otherwise, you know, maintaining an in-person opportunity to vote with a, a poll worker or a county elections official that maybe trust more in their particular circumstance, we need to make sure that those opportunities remain available and that we're not uh, supplanting one way of voting for another. Okay. Uh, we've, as we come here to the end of the questions, uh, now everybody's going to be panicky. The moderator's got a little quick prerogative because I just want to, I think this is instructive before you go to your closing statements. Number one priority, bullet point, number one priority, uh, Pete Peterson. Make sure vocal is completed legitimately on time, if not earlier. Number one priority. Absolutely. Day one, top to bottom review on the status of vocal. Okay, well, there you go. Well, now we know what's going to happen on January uh, when the oath of office is taken. We could just end there. Let's don't end there. Uh, a closing statements now, 60 seconds each, and uh, again, by the order that was agreed to, Pete Peterson, you're first. Well, John, thanks so much, and thank you to you all for ACLU and the other organizations that have hosted. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, I've gotten a lot of endorsements, as I said in the beginning, but I think the endorsement that I most treasure came just a couple days ago from a alternative newspaper called San Diego City Beat. And in their words, and I quote, even though Republicans scare the bleep out of us, we are endorsing Pete Peterson. Now, the reason they're endorsing me, and I was the only Republican of all the statewide offices that they endorsed, were twofold. Number one, I have the most unique background in nonpartisan civic engagement of anyone who has ever run for this office. And they want someone who's in a nonpartisan way but with a background in civic engagement and technology to lead what will be a crucial next six to eight years in this office. The other reason they endorsed me was because Alex had come out against Prop 11 back in 2008, the independent redistricting, which was really a move by many good government advocates. I support it as well. I try to recruit people to the redistricting commission to get more citizens involved in redistricting. If you're a politician, you're concerned about your own power. I'm concerned about your power. And that's time. Uh, Alex Padilla, your closing statement. Thank you very much. Well, as I mentioned earlier tonight, and I'm a proud uh, son of immigrants to this country living the American dream. And with uh, your support, if I earn it, I'll be the next uh, Secretary of State for the state of California. I'm committed to make it easier to start a business in this state, committed to engaging more voters in our democracy, and I'm absolutely committed to protecting our voting rights. Uh, I'm proud of the skills and the experience that I bring uh, to this campaign and to the office, of getting things done for the state of California for 15 and a half years. I've spent decades personally recruiting people to register and vote if they weren't registered before, and to getting, to vote, uh, getting out to vote on Election Day. I haven't just lectured about it. I've been working across party lines, uh, passing more than 80 laws in the state of California to benefit the people of the state of California. I'm ready to serve. I thank you for your consideration. I thank the host this evening for our sixth, seventh forum that we've uh, attended together. Uh, and remind everybody, 26 days from today, please get out and vote and remind your family, your friends, all your loved ones to get out and vote. Good. Thank you, sir. And uh, let, let me thank all of you, too. I believe Lori Schellenberger from the ACLU is coming up, but as, as she comes up, if you, you may, uh, I would just thank all of you. Thank, uh, let me uh, thank you for being part of this, and let me echo uh, Alex Padilla by saying, you know, the, the pundits say that non -people, a lot of people are going to show up on November 4th. Uh, I think we should prove them wrong. So, Lori? Uh. Uh, and I also, we, I want to thank John Myers, who is, was wonderful as always, and, and to, our, to our wonderful community panelists who asked really hard-hitting questions, I think, and to our ever-vigilant League of Women Voters timekeepers who kept us on schedule.
And to all of you, because coming out on a weeknight, I know it's not easy, and we really appreciate your, your interest and your participation. And also, we want you to know this, vi this was videotaped and will live on the Berkeley YouTube channel uh, until the election. So please let people know the link is on the program that you received. If you didn't get one, they're lying on the table out there. Uh, it will also be rebroadcast on, on Univision on all their uh, radio stations. That's on the back of your program, too, this weekend on Sunday from 9 to 10 a.m. Most importantly, don't forget to vote. And if you got your vote by mail ballot this week, if you're a vote by mail voter, don't forget it has to be to arrive on election day. Please remember to put a stamp on it, to sign it, to sign the envelope and mail it well before election day so it arrives. And if you're not a vote by mail voter, then please vote on November 5th. If you're not registered to vote, you can register to vote online. Oh, I'm fourth, I'm sorry. That's right, that was it. November 4th, don't vote on November 5th. Yeah. So, Nobody and yeah, and the registration deadline is on October 20th, so you still have time to register or change your registration if you're not registered to vote where you live. So, thank you, everyone.